Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. And if you are watching us on YouTube, you know, you can listen to us on every major podcast platform. If you're listening to us on one of those podcast platforms, check us out on YouTube as well. Please subscribe, leave a comment, leave a review, let your friends and family members all know about the lunch hour. Very excited to bring on our guest today. Uh, his name is David Kapos. He's a partner at the storied law firm of Cravath, Swain and Moore in their New York office. Uh, he is uh, the former undersecretary for intellectual property uh, at the U.S. Department of Commerce, as well as the head of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. He's got a lengthy legal career. I uh, went to UC Davis undergrad, went to uh, UC Berkeley for law school. Uh, David, welcome. Welcome to the show. So glad to have you on. Yeah, Andrew, thanks for having me on. So let's start here, which is, you know, uh, the, the issue of intellectual property, I worked on 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 real property rights issues. And as folks, as you need to understand that when I talk about that, I'm that's land property rights issues. I don't mean to to to, uh, to uh, denigrate in any way intellectual property. They're the same thing, essentially. Uh, talk about the importance of intellectual property in terms of innovation and prosperity for a nation, David. Yeah, sure. Great place to start, Andrew. So look, we're living in a knowledge economy. We're living in an inno innovation-driven economy. You think about artificial intelligence, you think about quantum computing, you think about mobile telecommunications, 5G and 6G right. and beyond, self-driving cars, whatever you think about, um, it's innovation-driven. The, the majority, in fact, going on plus 85% of the value of the S&P 500 is in intangibles. That's a wow. reversal from the mid 1980s when 85% of, of corporate value was intangibles, 85% plus in intangibles. Wow. So that's a way of saying innovation is where the action is. It drives value, it drives job creation, it drives economic outcomes, it drives national leadership, it drives global leadership. Right. And it's all underpinned by a strong and effective intellectual property system. That's the ability of the government to grant and enforce patents and trademarks for brands and copyrights for works of art and authorship. Um, and of course, trade secrets protecting things like recipes and customer lists that are best kept secret. So, I mean, it, it's interesting. Two books that changed my life, uh, Property and Freedom by Richard Pipes, and the Mystery of Capital by the Peruvian economist and political scientist Hernando de Soto, both essentially talk about this issue of the essential nature of property rights in ensuring that a society is both prosperous and stable. I don't know if you've read either of those books, but 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 talk about the, the necessity of, of folks being able to invest in their own ideas and what that means for a society overall. So Andrew, I'll stick with your historical metaphor here and go back to yet another famous commentator, Jeremy Bentham okay. um, of the UK, who very pithily um, wrote, um, he who has no hope of reaping rewards will have no reason to sow seeds. Wow. It's as simple as that. Without a strong and effective intellectual property system, most creativity is appropriable by everyone and anyone else. Right. And where ideas, creativity, whatever, even land, if it's appropriable by someone else, nobody will invest in it. It sure. is as simple as that. So intellectual property, to quote another famous historical sure. character, Abraham Lincoln, right? Right. Who said in his case, the patent system brought the fuel of interest to the fire of genius, right? It's, it's intellectual property that enables investment in ideas, simple you know, as And I appreciate you making that Lincoln connection because, of course, Cravath has this connection to Lincoln through uh, William Henry Seward, who was a partner in the law firm that was one of the precursors to Cravath, Swen, and more. So I, I appreciate that greatly. Let's sort of get into a little bit to your history, and then, I, then we'll get to the issue of pharmaceuticals and, and the Baidol march-in situation. Um, you know, when you were at uh, Berkeley, um, and then after, were you interested in intellectual property law at that time, or is this something that developed over time? Talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, I was from the beginning. I started out as an electrical and computer engineer, oh, wow. you know, designing cache modules in mainframe computers for IBM. Yeah, in the 1980s. And um, it was then that I learned that a brand new court had been created um, in 1982, late, late 82, early 83, called the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit that was okay, going yes. to hear all patent appeals. And it was recommended to me, in fact, by my brother-in-law at the time, who was a young law student then at Pepperdine University. You know, maybe you should think about going to law school because it looks right. like there's going to be a future <laughs> in a strong and effective patent system brought on by the federal circuit. That's that that is that is a, a, amazing, and it's interesting, right? Because as we get into this story, so much was going on with intellectual property in the early eighties. In fact, I think that is a perfect segue into the Bay Dole Law of nineteen eighty and what that did, um, and, and, and tie that in with the the creation of the uh, Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Yeah, that's exactly right, Andrew. And it was like a watershed moment, right? Between the creation of the Federal Circuit and then the passage of the bipartisan Bay Dole Very Act, point. Yes. Um, which simply um, uh, enabled um, uh, universities, research labs, um, small companies to take title to the inventions that they created using federal funding. Right. And going back to your question earlier about, you know, what is it about intellectual property that we all should value? It's when um, those nonprofits and universities and labs and small companies could take title that they could go to their boards um, and their investors and recommend investment in taking great federal funded research and bringing it into the marketplace as products and services. So the Bayh-Dole Act was absolutely groundbreaking, as simple as it sounds and as simple as it was. It turned the, the, the whole notion of federal funded research and its ability to drive products and services in the marketplace. It turned it from a total failure before Bayh-Dole, nearly no federal R&D wound up finding its way into the marketplace. Um, into a huge national success, so much so that many other companies, many other countries have copied the Bayh-Dole Act. They have their own versions of it. It's been heralded, the Bayh-Dole Act, as possibly the most important business legislation of the entire 20th century. That's interesting. And it's one of these things where it's such, a, for, for folks outside of the intellectual property law world, it is such an obscure law. Um, talk about what it meant for the pharmaceutical industry or, or pharmaceuticals, yeah. not, not the industry, because I think that I think that's myopic to just put it in terms of industry. But in terms of it, yeah. the 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 invention of new new and innovative drugs and what that means for American society and global society, talk talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So yeah, you know, life sciences um, uh, innovation writ large. So so. The government, federal government, to its great credit, funds billions of dollars in aggregate a year yeah. of um, what's called head end or upstream basic innovation, which um, goes to some of the national labs, you know, scientists at places like NIH, National Institutes for Health, um, National Science Foundation, et cetera, but, but also goes to many universities and, um, and research institutions to do basic research. Sure. That basic research frequently results in the discovery of possible new drug candidates. Yeah. This is a long way from saving people's lives or being safe and efficacious and right. approved by the FDA. But it turns out that a few million dollars in many cases of that early federal funding can enable a university, for example, to produce a possible drug candidate um, that then um, attract, because the university gets to own the patent, a la the Bayh-Dole Act, right. the university is able to then license the patent exclusively to a, a, a for-profit company that specializes in uh, taking candidates and qualifying them as likely to be efficacious, likely to be effective in treating a disease, probably not going to have huge side effects, probably not going to um, uh, have other issues like difficulty of manufacturing or 
very hard to administer those kinds of things. And then frequently that midstream research company um, creates more IP all on its own dime and may spend upwards of a half a billion dollars. So you got a few million dollars in federal funded research that's leveraged then into much more um, private sector research and development. And then finally, that company licenses what it's done down to a, um, a research biopharma company that's got the arms and legs to get into the marketplace. Sure. It invests more billions of dollars to a total of perhaps one to three billion dollars and finally gets drug into the marketplace. So that's how the, the system works. Um, federal funding, a modest amount um, with with a patent funded by do- or covered by the Bidol Act, right. owned by the university, licensed down years later after lots of work, drug goes into the marketplace. It works brilliantly. And once the drug goes into the marketplace, because the university licensed it originally, the university gets a cut of the, the profits on that. So, exactly. so in, in terms of that, how much are we talking about in terms of funding that goes back to these universities? On Do we have any quantified numbers as to what that means? Yeah, I can certainly share my own experiences. Yeah. This is what I do as my day job. Right, so right. I do these deals. They they do, all, you know, not, not just usually, but basically they always have milestone payments to the universities that'll start, you know, when various events occur and they'll be small at first, like maybe hundreds of thousands or a few million dollars, but they escalate to tens of millions of dollars and hundreds of millions of dollars and then on the back end, if and when a product gets introduced, there'll be a running royalty that'll right. frequently escalate from three to five to seven to nine percent. It is not uncommon that universities make in aggregate hundreds of millions or billions of dollars um, from that head end uh, research that they did. And it all gets plowed back into new labs, new equipment, new endowed chairs, which produces more innovation. So it's a huge virtuous cycle. In the military, they call it a force multiplier, right? The things that you do that sort of build up and and allow for, um, uh, they serve to create more forces down the road. I I guess it's, it's one of these things where, as I think about it, you know, we are in a time where we are having a major national conversation about universities and the funding of universities and university tuitions and the cost of college. Um, you know, that just came out, uh, Mississippi, for instance, yesterday it was announced earlier this week was announced that the legislature is demanding that three universities in Mississippi close state funded universities in Mississippi close. So at a time when we could ill afford to muck around with universities funding sources, yet there now is this effort, uh, this issue of March in, and I want to, we'll get, I want to get into the details of this, but let's sort of tee it up. What is March in and, and how does that figure now into all of this? Yeah. So, so Andrew, um, in the original Bayh-Dole Act, there was a safety net provided, right. and it's called the March in right. And what it said, and still says, the law is obviously still on the books, um, it says that um, in, in, in some very unusual um, edge case circumstances. That's important. Yeah. If, if the... Um, the party, the university, to be specific, that receives, or the nonprofit, or the research lab, or whatever, that receives federal funding, fails to commercialize, fails to make progress toward commercialization, fails to put in reasonable efforts at doing something with the IP, then the federal government can march in right. and grant a license to a third party. So, and, and, so that was a backstop. And they do this because what they don't want is to give universities money to do research that and that might be fruitful that they don't do anything with. It's essentially tantamount to being a safeguard against the universities committing fraud. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, yeah exactly right. And, and as a result, right, the universities all build um, extensive mechanics into their licenses that they grant downstream, as I explained before, that require the next company and then the next company after it to exercise reasonable efforts to move a product forward. Or the university can itself take the license back and give it to another party. And all of this is because we we create these incentives to do this, the the incentives towards innovation down the road. Everybody wins if everybody does their job, but everybody loses if they don't. Yet um, um, we're seeing this flipped on its head, 
aren't we with the latest proposal? But let me start actually before we get into what they're flipping. The thing that's not sat right with me as I've learned more about this that I find very strange is that this is all being done. The the recent proposal on Marchin is being done under the auspices of the National Institutes for Standards and Technology. How do they figure into all this? Why yeah, is it NIST. NIST? Yeah, NIST, the National Institute for, for, I mean, for Standards and Technology, which is an agency in the Department of Commerce, which yeah. is the same place the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office okay. is housed. So, you know, when I was in the Obama administration, I worked extensively with my counterpart at NIST. It's a great agency. Sure. Um, NIST, in addition to many things it does involving standards, one of the things it does is to manage for the administration um, the Bayh-Dole Act. Act. And, Interesting. And, and uh, entities compliance with the Bayh-Dole Act. So NIST put out a proposal, uh, a, a, what, about two months ago now, a little over two months ago, um, mm-hmm. in the Federal Register. Uh, if you if you knew what you were looking for, you you took notice of it. If you if you didn't know, you didn't. Uh, they the the proposal essentially turns this safety valve, this margin provision on its or the things underlying the margin provision on its head, doesn't it? Yeah, very very, very unfortunately. What it what it what the proposal does is to invite and in fact mandate um, the federal government to march in under circumstances that are extremely broad and that were not only never intended but expressly excluded from the Bayh-Dole Act. For instance, price expressly excluded from the Bayh-Dole Act on the basis that the market should set price. Right. And federal bureaucrats should absolutely not be in, um, uh, interdicting in setting prices. So now, if this NIST proposal goes through, we're going to have, um, you know, federal bureaucrats somewhere in the government, presumably in, in NIST or somewhere else, who are going to be setting prices on products and services um, that result from federally funded research. It's it you know, and we know that this is a goal of the administration. They want to get price controls on certain pharmaceuticals uh, or a broad range of pharmaceuticals that are out there. But this is really taking a sledgehammer to something that should be done in a very precise way, shouldn't it? Well, right, and and they've already got um, uh, legislation that's been passed and is being implemented that manages prices, regulates prices on certain drugs. A couple of things I should say, Andrew, is Please. I agree that this NIST proposal has been styled as um, managing drug costs. It's actually much broader than that. It applies to the entire economy. Right. So if you, if you read the proposal and the examples at the end of the proposal, they apply to um, you know areas like material science, um, uh, you know, uh, anything you could imagine, any sure. technology from information technology, computers, um, cellular cellular communications um, to um, quantum computing, um, every again, materials right. like new chemistry, everything is actually covered. So it's 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 a proposal that's not just limited to life sciences. And then the other thing you should know is that even, the part that is directed to life sciences uh, oddly um uh, you know won't work so the proposal will create chaos but it won't work and the reason it won't work is because as i mentioned when i was explaining how the ecosystem right. for life sciences works you got a little bit of money federal money that results in a patent upstream at the research university then you've got literally billions that get invested below that Sure. not funded by the federal government that tends to produce more patents yes. that is, that are not subject to the Bayh-Dole Act. So the, the life sciences ecosystem, um, even if you now have the federal government able to march in and take away patent rights to the universities, what you do do is hurt the universities, but you won't change the, the price of the drug because most of the IP isn't under the Bayh-Dole Act. So this sense. is like a lose-lose, right? You create chaos, you'll starve off funding because um, companies won't want or boards and venture capitalists and private equity won't want to invest. You'll hurt universities by taking away their funding and you won't actually solve uh, if there was a problem with drugs, We different conversation. 
solved elsewhere, you're not going to solve it. Well, I, 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 I do have a question about that, but I want to I want to get into the, the legal substance for a moment and because I know this goes well beyond the Chevron discussion that is happening up at the high court right now. This gets to some fundamental issues with the Administrative Procedure Act, which is that, uh, you know, a, a rulemaking, a proposal cannot be arbitrary, capricious and abuse of discretion or otherwise not in accordance with the law. This seems to be all of those things at the same time. How can you take what is very clear legislative language that excludes certain um, uh, instances and flip it on its head and say, well, you know, the le- the statutory language be damned. How is this not arbitrary, capricious and abuse of discretion or otherwise not in accordance with the law? Well, it is. Andrew. Yeah. And yeah, you could be sure this um, this overreach, this land grab will get challenged in court. I would tell you, even if Chevron deference isn't abolished, which right. it probably will be, even if it isn't abolished, this is illegal this and is it's going point. to yes. be found yeah. to be illegal. If Chevron deference is abolished, which is I think we're agreeing is probably going to happen, yeah. doubly illegal. Yeah, we are. Well, I just had a conversation with Veronique de Rugy at uh, the Mercatus Center at George Mason University uh, talking about the um, we have to prepare ourselves for the post Chevron world. And we seem to be un, un, very unprepared for it. I, I mean, I want to talk. Let's talk about this, because I, I, I do want to I do want to sort of. Uh, take a sort of a side note on this, which is, I get it. We want to reduce the cost of very expensive prescription drugs, which are generally drugs that still have their periods of exclusivity on them in terms of what the, you know, uh, the, the, the patent holders have, they have this dozen year period of exclusivity before the generic can come in. Is there not any discussion about simply finding a way to buy out the periods of exclusivity on these certain drugs? I mean, is that too expensive? Is that too broad? What are what are your thoughts here? You know, that to, to my knowledge, that hasn't been discussed. As yeah. I mentioned before, you know, we've had legislation uh, that went through and is being implemented now that regulates drug prices right. on some drugs. So um, I don't necessarily love that legislation, right. but to the extent you feel there was a problem and it needed to be solved. It already was. T- taking away patent protection doesn't solve any problem. It just creates new problems. And, and let's talk about one of those that you just wrote about uh, that uh, our, our, our friend uh, Scott Hoganson sent over to me, which is the impact on historically black colleges and universities. Again, getting into this issue, we just we know what's happening down in Mississippi. Um, uh, to talk, talk about that. Talk about the impact on the smallest colleges that rely the most on these kinds of uh, arrangements. Yeah, well, yeah, the HBCUs and other small colleges, um, I've already seen an example where, um, it, it, and, the, and the, the, the NIST proposal isn't even effective yet, it's just a proposal right, right now. But I've, I've already run into a situation um, with a small college that was offered um, federal money um, and the agency already built in march in language that wow. mirrors what will be in the regulation but it's now it's built it into a contract and i told the university you know um if you if you accept this money probably nothing's going to happen with the research because no yeah for-profit company or their board or their investors are going to permit them to take the license when it's got a margin provision in it. And the answer from the university was, well, look, we die if we don't take this money. So we have to take the money and we understand that it'll probably lead nowhere and it'll leave us poorer in the long run. So there's an an unfortunate bind that the universities are in. Actually, let's focus on that for a second because we understand, you know, uh, my, my colleague Wayne Cruz, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, talks about regulatory dark matter, things that wind up having the force of regulation that aren't regulations, you know, guidance documents, interpretation letters. Here, we're talking about the implementation of the regulatory proposal through contract language that hasn't been vetted through the APA. I mean, that's a problem in and of itself. It's a de facto implementation of something that hasn't gone through the formal rulemaking process. Am I am I understanding that correctly? Exactly right. And I was stunned when I saw that. I mean that that is that is in, incredible here. Um, I mean, here's the thing that I get buoyed by, David. Um, the fact that you know you were an Obama administration official. Uh, you were head of the Patent and Trademark Office and this under uh, the Undersecretary for of, of the Department of Commerce. 
And we can create in the same way that by Dole was bipartisan, there is really a bipartisan effort to sort of to push back on this and recognized, yeah, um, to push back on on uh, um, uh, on what's happening here. Talk about why that's important, the, the bipartisan nature of these things. Yeah, well, yeah, this is not an R issue or a D issue. Right. This is a national competitiveness issue. It's an innovation incentives issue. It's a national leadership issue, right? Our Our international competitors are absolutely salivating, starting with sure. um, uh, the People's Republic of China of at the prospect of U.S. funded, of government funded R&D not getting implemented in the U.S. because that's just sitting out there. It's all patented. So it's available then for the Chinese government to take and fund its own top down managed labs to implement, get all those downstream patents and then China right. take them. So it, you know, absolutely, Andrew. This is um, this is not an R issue. It's not a D issue. It's very bipartisan, just like the Bayh-Dole Act was it, it, about protecting a, innovation incentives. It's amazing to me because, you know, one would one would hope that a former Obama administration official would be able to have a conversation with the folks at OMB, um, the folks at the White House who are undoubtedly driving this policy, and say. Do you not understand what the impacts are? Not that I want you to divulge this, but have you had conversations with folks? Do you have, do they, have they not been not made to understand before the proposal was put out that this was going to open up a, a massive hornet's nest? So I, I, I have in the sense of I've participated and signed on to at least one, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting now, maybe as many as two letters um, into the administration. One, that um, uh, is signed by quite a few former R&D administration officials from, from USPTO, from, uh, from NIST, um, and, and other places in the government, all telling the current administration, look, you know, we, we had these jobs before. We know how right. this works. This is a bad idea. It, it, it's a situation. Here's, here's my hope in all of this, right? We've, we've had a couple of instances in the last two months where the administration has made some very audacious regulatory proposals, um, one of them having to do on the, on the investment side of things um, uh, with, with regards to um, clean air and clean water rights, that they have pulled them when there has been a, a more of a hue and cry from the, and again, as you, I agree with you, this is not an R, this is not a blue team, red team situation. Um, but when a number of folks from the blue team made, you know, their concerns known about about some things, they've pulled them back. Any hope at this point? Do we do we know or do people just need to make sure that they keep the pressure on and keep letting folks in the administration know, let their members of Congress know about what's going on? Well, right. Yeah, please do, Andrew. That's that's the top line message yeah. for me here is that your listeners need to speak out, speak out to their members of Congress um, and do it now. So you're probably aware that there have been uh, there's at least one letter that I know of that went in from members of Congress, R&D, again, very bipartisan to the administration. I think to Janet Raimondo also the um, uh, uh, or sorry, Gina Raimondo, yeah. the secretary of commerce. Um, in informing them of uh, the opposition on the Hill, I think that's great yeah. um, to answer your question directly. I don't know if we're going to be successful. I haven't heard that the administration right. is reconsidering, but I hope they do. And I hope, and this is not a case where you can like reword things or be a little more right. precise. Yes. The whole idea just needs to be dropped. Sure. It, it's a really bad idea. It just needs to be dropped. In the comments that we filed, uh, the Center for Regulatory Freedom filed, uh, um, uh, that's exactly what we said. <laughs> this is this is not something that can be reworked. It has to just be scrapped entirely. Let me turn our attention a little bit to some other fun stuff. Um, I know you're working on, on, on cryptocurrency issues. I've written about this. I'm someone who believes that it's neither fish nor fowl. And by that, I mean, you know, we, we can't put cryptocurrency into the same model that we've talked about it, whether it's a, a commodity or a security uh, or, or, um, um, uh, or a currency, right? It's, it's, to me, it's, it's all of those things may be closest to a commodity uh, more so than it is to a, so, so, but deeply concerned that regulatory action is being taken before Congress has spoken about this. 
Are you concerned that you know we we need to really define what cryptocurrency is before we can take regulatory action on it? Yeah, I am. I am also Andrew, and and I I hope that um, the moves that uh, you know uh, Gary Gensler, the SEC folks, and some other agencies, somewhat in competition in regulatory competition with each other, I hope they don't have the effect of you know discouraging more capital formation and investment around, I'll call it modern, cutting edge financial technology right. uh, good innovation. We need that. The U.S. needs to lead in that regard, or other countries will gladly take away the mantle and lead. And, and ha you know, having, um, call it digital currencies writ large, whether it's, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, some other form of crypto or whatever, are very democratizing in right. their own way, permitting and enabling the unbanked to get access to financial services. That's kind of an important thing. 100%. It needs to be regulated and managed, right? It, but it also needs to be permitted to grow. And that's where I agree with you. And I fear, you know, we could be stepping into overregulation. It's a situation where it's even the, the underlying tech, the, the blockchain technology has such great promise. Um, colleagues, you know, I taught at William & Mary for a couple of years until the pandemic screwed that all up. I was doing some work with their, with their efforts on cryptocurrency as part of their global research institute. Um, very, very important that the, the ideas or the, the world problems that can be solved, not, not everything can be solved, obviously, but, you know, like I, I visited refugee camps in Algeria back in 2010. Um, the idea that these refugees could, you know, get their identities and get banked and have a census and we can know who all is there as a way of getting them to be able to return to their home countries. That's amazing. And like everything else, it's exactly what you said to tee this all off. It's the intangible ideas that can change the world. We have to make sure that we protect the 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 rights that are inherent in them. It, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, well, and give and give them a chance to flourish. And there's two components to that. One we're talking about now is the regulatory component, not yes. having regulators kill the golden the the goose laying the golden eggs. And on the other hand, strong incentives to invest through a strong and effective intellectual property system. Sure. All right. So, so uh, before I let you go, one of the things I do like to do, um, because I, 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 you know, I was almost going to do a podcast called Outside Interests, in which I was talking to policymakers and politicians about the things that they do outside of their policymaking and politicking, because I think we need to humanize the folks who are doing this kind of work more. Uh, I know you as a partner at Cravath are in incredibly busy, uh, having worked those 24-hour days myself when I was working at, uh, at Cravath many, many years ago. I had a thing, just real quick. Um, I knew in the early 1990s, that I could call Cravath 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and I would find one of my friends working at their desk. I, not that that's a great thing necessarily, but I knew that. Knowing how busy you are, though, when you are not working, uh, what? how are you recreating? What are some of your outside interests? You know, first of all, Andrew, I can assure you it is still the same at Good. Cravath. Um, Good. We, we pride ourselves on 24 by 7 availability. So outside of work... You know, I, I love the outdoors. It's so um, refreshing and invigorating that my favorite thing to do this time of year is snowshoeing with my nice. dogs in the wilderness um, around our home in Vermont. In the summertime, it's hiking those same trails. Let those dogs run and right. and uh, get out and walk. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. That's something that we did a couple of weeks ago. We were trying to, I, I now live in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, and we've not gotten a lot of snow, but north and west of us, we were getting snow. We have a essentially a miniature husky, um, and we wanted to get him out. So we went on a search for snow. We didn't find much of it, but we took the dogs on a on a great hike uh, in the woods. So I I understand. Um, uh, David, how do folks find out more about the good work that you are doing at Cravath? And generally, how do they find out more about the Buy Dole Law and this March in proposal? Yeah, I think the way to do that is to go to um, our our nonprofit called the Council for Innovation Promotion nice. that I co-chair, um, and and you can find it at C4IP Council for Innovation Promotion C4IP.org. There's a lot of by goal information there, links to the letters we've written, links to letters others have written. And Andrew, one other thing I did want to mention, please sure you notice this. The letters that are going in from universities, many universities, you know, big famous ones, 
are not from the tech transfer offices. They're, they're all sending letters to NIST and to the administration commenting on this crazy proposal. They're coming from the presidents and the chancellors of the right. university saying, you are going to ruin our university if you do this. This is really dire stuff. This is not, you know, like around the edges, like lawyers arguing. This is, right, the, the leaders of right. institutions are telling the government um, en masse, stop, you're doing the wrong thing. At a time when they can ill afford to lose that kind of funding. If Listen, if my alma mater, William & Mary, is not uh, is not a part of that, let me know. I will I will uh, try to flex some influential muscle. Uh, David Capos, thank you so very much for joining us today. Yeah, Andrew, great to be on. Thank you. And this has been yet another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. As I said at the beginning, if you like what you're hearing and you want to watch us, uh, check us out on YouTube. If you're watching us on YouTube, please give us a listen on all major podcast platforms. Please subscribe, leave a review, and let everybody you know know about what we're doing here at the Lunch Hour. As I said, I'm Andrew Langer. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream 